Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Facebook Live. I have a couple of guests today. You'll be seeing Kathy and Samantha in a minute. But I first want to tell you that the chicken fabric is back. We had it for a while. It sold really fantastically. Samantha, who's here today, had made a dress out of it and showed it to you when she was on a few weeks ago. It's back. So just a little reminder, it's back on the website. Check it out. And chickens fly out fast. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> so order today. It doesn't last long. <laughs> I've had a couple of emails from people who enjoy some of the books that I talk about, so I thought I would tell you about two more books today that have really captured my attention. The first one is called Threads of Life. This is just a series of short stories that talk about people from around the globe who use the language of sewing to make their voices heard. The stories are from historical perspective, current perspective, and all around the globe. And I think it's a really fun, easy read. I love short stories anyway, so check that one out. And then I took a class, an online virtual class, from French General. And I was surprised that you, Kathy, had not heard of French General. No, I had to look at that. So mm -hmm. I thought perhaps maybe other people hadn't either. <laughs> French General is a company out of Los Angeles. And they do a lot of uh, online classes and classes in person. And currently are doing some classes, some virtual classes, with people out of the UK on hand stitching. And since we're talking about hand stitching later today, I thought I would tell you about this little book called Threads of feeling. I have to sort of read my little script here because I have a little trouble remembering the name of this place, but it's called, it's about the London Foundling Hospital between 1740 and 1770. It's all about textile tokens. It was a hospital that took in babies and children who were disbanded, or disp is that a that's not the word I want to use, who were abandoned, that's the <laughs> word I want to use. And to identify them later, they took a piece of their clothing and attached the pieces, of uh, the scraps of fabrics, to the documentation of their entry into the hospital. And so the book is all about that. And I found it to be a really sweet book, really touching book. And one of the classes that I took from French General was based on the concepts of this book. But even if you don't take the class, I think you'd find the book really interesting. So this is the week that we uh, sent out, I guess it was last week actually, that we sent out the So Confident Issue 10. And I want to show you the garment that is featured. It is the Crossroads shirt. Why don't you hold that, Kathy? I meant to button this up, but didn't, because we've been trying it on all morning. But the Crossroads shirt is the fourth pattern in the series for 2020. You get the pattern. It's part of the package. And we show variations of it uh, throughout the next three months, October, November, and December, and this is the first one. So Samantha, come on in here. Samantha's here. She's here for the class that starts tomorrow. That is the um, Sashiko stitching class. First of all, we have to show that for some reason we all were thinking the same color scheme today. We're all in red and black and even white. Even Aaron. And even Aaron <laughs> behind the camera has on black and white stripes and a black skirt. Go figure. But at any rate, before we get into this jacket, Samantha, let's talk about the jacket that you have on. Because this is the Liberty... Mix. The Mix It. With the Mix It. Ah, the Liberty shirt with the Mix It yes. neckline. Yes. And you did the embroidery. I did. Machine embroidery, in this case. The butterfly, the roses. And then she's taken it in so it's a little more sculpted. I think it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, and talk about the studs. The studs is a twill tape that I bought. Okay. And just added after the fact. Well, because it, I thought it really helped. It, it sets it off. Yes. Oh no question. Yeah. And this is a black crinkled type fabric. We have a few variations of this sort of fabric still around. It's a wonderful cotton. And then you faced it with some black and white check and added that as well. Yeah. So thought we'd show you that. But we want you to put okay. this shirt on. And the reason she's putting this shirt on is that. A month or so ago when Samantha was here for a workshop, she and Kathy got together and spent three days working on this Crossroads jacket. I was Kathy's bitch. 
<laughs> I see. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. There was I a, got to work with Kathy. There so. was a real collaboration. Oh my gosh, I couldn't have done it without her. It was interesting. So how did you guys start? How did you pull the fabrics and what did you do? Well, we did stand at the table with many bolts of fabric. And then we went through an editing process of taking it maybe down to six different fabrics. And just stop there and used what we had. If we thought we needed something else, we didn't go get it. We used what we had. And you, I thought it worked out yeah. beautifully, but we're, we're everyone gonna, helped with choices. Well, there's a, obviously in the issue 10, we go into much more detail about that process of the designing. A couple of fabrics are backed in a stripe, one in a narrow stripe yeah, and yes. one in a wide stripe. Yeah. So one was a voile fabric that has an underlayment of the stripes. And the whole uh, garment is underlined in China silk or, yeah, Bemberg, I'm not sure which it is. I think uh, that's China silk. Yes, China silk. So anyway, you'll see uh, more about this. And we're going to do a little video after this Facebook Live session for the So Confident members. So we'll talk more in depth about that. Erin took some purchased jeans, if you want to hold those, and took some of the scraps of fabric and did an applique of the scraps on the jeans. So that's also featured in the issue 10. So okay, Samantha, your job yeah. is done. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, many of you know Kathy Davis, and I've introduced her in previous Facebook Lives, but to just give you a little, little something for those of you who are maybe tuning in for the first time, Kathy and I worked together for a long time, 20 plus years, and Kathy's retired, but she does help us making some very special garments and is more of a, a creative inspiration to us today than a day-to-day -day, uh, workhorse, <laughs> I guess I'll call you that. Um, <laughs> but we, she comes in, we play, we work together, we figure some things out. She goes home and recreates uh, her interpretation of what we've talked about, <laughs> and I'm always really amazed and, and surprised and not surprised at the same time of the beautiful work that she does. So tomorrow we start our last workshop of the year and the class uh, originally was billed as a Contemporary Sashiko class. Contemporary Sashiko is actually the name, a trade name uh, by Nancy Schreiber who has developed a method of stitching, uh, Sashiko stitching, uh, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And she was to have done the class but uh, chose not to do the class. So Kathy has stepped in and uh, thankfully, you and I are teaching the class tomorrow. So we thought we'd do a little bit of a preview of a couple of the jackets that Kathy has done, and then I guess a couple that I've done as well. And we're going to show you the idea of using our patterns and a combination of applique, stitching, the basic running stitch, just simple, simple ways to embellish a garment. Uh, using one or two fabrics and a simple running stitch. But first of all, you and I were talking about what is the difference between burrow, cantha, and sashiko. And we all get this all mixed up, right? Well, it's all really very similar. Sashiko is probably the most formal design. The rest of it's um, you know, something for mending or patching together. Right. Bur so I tried to, Nancy Schreiber was uh, nice enough to send me her very uh, full uh, descriptions of these terms. And so I tried to borrow and just do a concise one-liner of, of what these are. So burr refers to a cloth that's been patched and mended numerous times using scraps. And not really meant to be show pieces. Cantha is more from India or that part of the world, layers of silk saris stitched together by hand. Sachiko is a simple running stitch to repair and preserve cloth, off, most often seen with Indian fa dyed fabric and white thread. All of them have the common denominator of the running stitch. So I actually took a class from uh, Recently, I think I talked about that a couple of weeks ago, and there are variations of running stitches. But for today's purpose, we're talking about the classic evenly stitched, sort of evenly stitched hand running stitch using something we're going to talk about. <laughs>
All right, let's look at some, some of your garments. So Kathy, you did this garment. Uh, this is the Chicago jacket and has been appliqued. So talk about how you approach this. Okay, well, first of all, I have to say the inspiration came from a retail designer, Run Holtz, who I thought was one person. When looking it up, it's a man and wife couple from Germany. And I've always kind of admired and, and kept um, in contact with their new designs each year. So they did have a jacket that was all raw edge. And you know, we're kind of getting the license now to let our garments be thready and raw edge. It takes a while, but this is probably the least raw edge <clears throat> I've done, although it is raw edge. So this is, what would you say, um, uh, sh uh, sh um, what's the silk here? Uh, this is, <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, th this is the fabric, and this is a it's sort like of a dupioni yeah. base. There you go, dupioni. Dupioni <laughs> base. Uh, <laughs> okay. You'd think two heads would be better than <laughs> one, not. but no, no, no. So dupioni <laughs> has some metallic threads. It has a raised metallic thread to it, and it's very ombre. Yes. So, uh, but the base of this is linen. The base is a very wonderful linen. We don't have any more, and uh, the. Dupioni just kind of was very complimentary to the color of the linen. Each piece has patches sewn onto it. And they're sewn on by machine first. Yes. B machine around first, the around the edge. I probably put them on with a little bit of the fusy web tape first, lay them out, put them on, and then go to the machine and I'll stitch just a presser foot away from the edge to keep them down. Now each piece is done as piece, I mean like the front, back, and sleeve are all completed and stitched before the garment's put together. And you had a little bit of a plan. Yeah, I do. Sometimes. Which is rare for Kathy. <laughs> it is Normally rare. Normally she's <laughs> all, you know, she just goes for it. She's so artistic and creative that this just kind of comes from her but in this case you did actually draw some things I did it was amazing and it's really handy to have it back but like here is the sleeve I don't know if you can see where I've taken a sharpie pen and I've drawn in the squares that I'd like to have so all the squares are different size the only thing I tried to keep uniform was maybe the space between the squares keeping it to like an inch apart so there was a little bit of uh, planning or sym symmetry in that. So all you had to do is measure your drawings. Yep. And then you did some hand stitching on top of that. All right. So the hand stitching I did, we would call that what? Boro? I call that sashiko, <laughs> but boro is the same thing I, in terms of the stitching. All right. So I did have embroidery floss. I used four strands of embroidery floss. But there, because the fabric was an ombre, I kind of have um, different colors here. I have some blue, I have some brown. You can see on the inside that I've changed colors. This one was a little more uniform stitching where I actually did chalk lines maybe a half an inch away from each other so I could keep them evenly spaced. So this was a little more planned for you. You right. drew it out. You knew how many patches. You cut them according to a, a layout, and you chalk marked the stitching line. Yeah. So that was a, a lot for me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this one is a. Sim this is the Chicago jacket, by the way. I don't think we mentioned that. So now this one. All right. This one got a little more informal. And probably because uh, the fabric kind of called for a little more informal. It's a uh, kind of a painted, splotchy-looked linen. We have it down here on the left-hand side. Hopefully, we'll show that in a minute. But yeah. the base fabric had some pattern to it. Not texture, but printed pattern. Yeah, it was like a sprayed paint or something that was really fan fantastic. So the top here is a linen gauze in a navy. We're having a couple of comments about the mics. Um, wondered if we could um, just make sure. sure. They're not hearing? If they say it's choppy. 
Oh. It might be like touching your, where is yours hooked in? Right here. <laughs> it wasn't hooked in. There you go. It is it? Am I better? Let's see. Where is yours? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to move it towards the middle. Well, I, ha I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that I stepped on this mic yesterday. Oh, <laughs> is it better? So let's see if, we, if it's better. If not, we'll go down to one mic. Would that be better? Maybe it's a... Uh, I'm speaking up, probably. Yeah, speaking okay. up. All right. Well, I'll be fine. Oh, I can yeah. shout. Oh. <laughs> All right. So I, the same patching, sewing technique on this one. It's a little more informal. The stitching on this, I did not mark an even lines across but what i did is maybe chose one line down and chalked it to just keep me going down straight or my first stitch so i wouldn't get off but this one i just stitched where i felt some things come down here some things come here it was a lot more informal it was really kind of fun the sleeve but also when you do this stitching, take it off to the edge so it kind of inhibits the raveling of the patch. This, the fabric that's on the top of this is a linen gauze. So it has some texture and it ravels mm -hmm. beautifully. It does. But it's somewhat, I wouldn't call it sheer, but there's a semi-sheerness to it. But I think the overall look of this has a very burrow type look where you have this mending patchwork uh, flavor right. to it and part, most of that is brought on by the fact that the base fabric of this is that texture mm -hmm. and then you have the gauze over the top of that. So it is a more casual perhaps uh, uh, approach. So this is the London shirt. So you've done this, a similar design on the Chicago and the London. With two different kind of flavors of... Right. Now let's talk about uh, what I've done. So this is a, a garment that I made in preparation for ASG National Conference a year and a half ago, I believe it was. Uh, summer of 2019. I've lost track a little bit, I think so. And Nancy Schreiber and I taught this class in, I think it was Philadelphia. Uh, if you travel like Nancy and I do, you lose track of what city you're in, and I think it was just Philadelphia. But at any rate, uh, this is Silk Dupioni. This is a Tremont jacket. And this has been underlined in flannel and stitched from the reverse side and then lined. But Nancy designed this lotus pattern so it's more of a, a controlled floral pattern with some lotus leaves. A little bit on the back, a little bit on the sleeve, and so forth. Um, that process is taking a piece of silk dupioni. Why don't you hold that a minute? And maybe take it up towards the camera. And then it's underlined in flannel on the reverse side. And you use some kind of a template in this case, these are templates from the Stencil Company, and their website is actually different than the actual name of their company. It's called the Stencil Company, and the website is quiltingstencils.com. If you go to that website and look under Theme of Stencils and look under Asian Inspired, there are hundreds of designs. But these little cutouts are what you use to put on the reverse side and with a pencil you just mark through the openings of the stencil and you'll get a pencil line then on the reverse side. So in this case this is done with, I've forgotten how many strands, uh, for like three or four strands, kind of your choice, of, of uh, regular DMC embroidery floss and you stitch it from the wrong side. So small running stitches, sachiko stitches from the wrong side, and you get this dimension on the right side, which I think is really beautiful. So this is a very contemporary sachiko concept based on Nancy Schreiber's uh, development of how you do this. So then I took the London, which is this design here, this pattern, and I lengthened it and did a little bit of all of the above that we've been talking about. So this is linen, 
a linen base with an organza overlay, a little bit of dupioni on the bottom in sections. I machine stitched a design and then cut out a few of the inside portions of the organza leaving the linen exposed and then I took kimono fabrics from the scraps we've talked about this we own 10,000 <laughs> yeah, that might be conservative <laughs> I usually exaggerate but this time I don't think I am um, thousands of kimono scraps we used to belong to the Ah kimono club where we would get these kimono pieces once a month they don't exist anymore which is really really too bad and really great because we have a lot <laughs> but at any rate um, <laughs> I machine stitched just like Kathy did she gave me the inspiration to do that and I machine stitched them on and then I did sashiko stitching in a more uh, random way in some circles and some straight lines both running stitch and in this case I used a back stitch at, and sometimes oh, yeah. as well so a little bit of a combination of ideas here but generally based on uh, what Kathy has developed in terms of applique and running stitch. Now this is a garment. This is the most charming garment. It this is. is our now shirt pattern without the collar. And Linda Wardlow, who lives here in Topeka, made this. Also inspired by Nancy Schreiber, who when we did a workshop in Arkansas, a couple of years ago had a jacket in a more indigo color base I believe it was and with some white stitching so this is a little more classic sashiko that you see where you have a dark base whether it's indigo dyed or not and the white thread and Linda Wardlow would have used multiple templates just like this to design and draw through her flannel and stitch from the wrong side so I can see two different templates on this side, two different templates on this side. I haven't counted, but there might be four or five different templates that have been used in this one garment. But I wish you could feel this because it has a wonderful feel. There's something about the flannel on the wrong side that gives this a really uh, beautiful feeling. And then of course the lining is not too shabby either. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful silk charmeuse lining that in just I don't know just pulls it off but this is classic sashiko and classic contemporary sashiko uh, a la Nancy Schreiber and this is the now jacket again one of our simplest and most usable patterns it comes in the pattern with the now and zen so you get actually two patterns in one then somewhere along the way <laughs> I did this vest. Um, this is in knit and two layers of knit. A taupe color on one side and a more blue-gray color on the reverse side. This is a garment that I made entirely while traveling in the car. I remember I go back and forth to Arkansas every once in a while and so all I did was draw this grid. Maybe you can see it here on the back. I drew a two inch grid and used some embroidery floss to stitch through both layers. And then for these little sections, I divided that and stitched little one inch squares and then cut them open just the top side so that it created this little uh, rolling effect of these triangles and then did some beads and sequins to highlight each square, repeated that division of the one inch squares through the lapel area and then on the reverse side added some beads there. This has also been bound in the knit with a, um, a what's that stitch called? What's this little, is that just a zigzag stitch? Yeah, that's not cretin, is it? No, I don't think it is cretin. Zigzag. I have a hard time doing the cretin stitch. <laughs> I know that. So put this over an, an Odette top and also in cotton knit. So the fabric that you use can be anything. It can be wool, linen, silk, knit. I'm not sure there's... I don't think there's any, any uh, rule about no. it. Cotton, all of it. 
Uh, this is a garment that, if, if all of this seems slightly overwhelming in terms of the volume of stitching, and you're not really sure about stitching. In fact, there are a lot of people that I hear, oh, hand stitching, I, I want nothing to do with that. Um, Karen Turnow from Art Oregon made this a while back. This is also a now shirt that's been lengthened just a little bit. And she just used the fabric. This was a striped fabric in black and brown. And she used the fabric to inspire her so that she used embroidery stitches as a division between the two color changes, added a couple of circles, inserted some buttons. And so it's a very, very simple way, but effective way to dress up a fairly basic fabric. So again, another now shirt. All right. I did a little bit of sashiko stitching for a book called The Sewing Workshop. This book is a compilation of several of the books that I did years ago, one called Sew Easy, Sew Easy Bags, Sew Easy Scarves, Sew Easy Something Else. It was like a four series, uh, series of books and the publisher combined those topics into one book. It's called The Sewing Workshop. And in that, I tried to find this bag, but this is a little bag that has been stitched on some dupioni. Again, using the template, some flannel, some lining. So that little bag is in here. I tried to find this bag yesterday, and I've made so many bags, and we have such a large basement <laughs> and so many tubs, it just didn't surface. So I can't show you the bag. But what I did find was, remember this? Oh, I love that. A tea cozy. Actually, it's the bag shape that I turned and added handles to create a bag, but it started out as a tea cozy. And again, it has the flannel lining and some sashiko stitching. Each of these sections has a different design on it and some vintage buttons, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, let's talk fabric a little bit. Oh, where to start? Let's see. Well, we can start right here. Uh, we chose some combinations that we thought would be really nice. A few weeks ago, I had on a Chicago jacket in a mat lisse, and it was cotton and linen, and I love the fabric. But we got this new color in, which is this lovely uh, soft, soft gray. And we think this would make a wonderful base for the same fabric that Kathy used here. Mm -hmm. Let's get this out to show how this fabric looks. So uh, fabrics like this, you know, you get with the ombre effect, you get, you're able to cut in various um, places on this fabric and that's how it looks like you've combined many fabrics when actually you've taken it from one fabric. Mm -hmm. So this would be a beautiful combination of this fabric on top of the mat lisse. Then this combination, we have the blue. This is what it looks like as the base fabric. And we think that this beautiful gauze linen knit, it's not a knit, it's woven. Yeah, yeah. linen <laughs> gauze would be beautiful for patchwork on this. Believe it or not, this is a linen. It looks like wool, but it is linen, and it has this wonderful texture to it in blues and browns. Um, I just realized that this would look awfully good on that as well. Yeah, well, I hadn't, hadn't really looked at that. I'd put this on it, too. And Yeah, this could go on this, this could go on this. Any of this would work together. Mm -hmm. Now, you're handling two cottons. So let's talk about that. How would you deal with these? These are cotton sateens. Well, I think this fabric would be a great base for the more traditional jacket of uh, if, if someone like Linda did. This would be beautiful with the flannel, with a white stitch on it, or any color you want. But um, You know, it would be kind of fun to do the burgundy stitching on the red or the red stitching on the burgundy. Right or white, yeah. that wouldn't really matter. But I agree with you, this needs to be backed in flannel. Now, we were talking about something this morning as we're picking out fabrics and combinations for, to, for the start of tomorrow's class. You think another 
option for the backing is, I think, a um, knit. Exactly. I mean, we found some uh, white knit for a project we we're going to do. You know, if you don't want to do the flannel, a knit would be a great backing right. that you have at home. Um, the nice thing about either one of those, the flannel or the knit, is that it has a grip to it. So these fabrics will adhere to them and it's easy to keep them together as you're sewing them. Some people use a hoop, some people don't. You do need to pin it together, maybe base it around the edges, maybe do some pinning throughout the uh, larger pieces to keep things settled in. Yeah, and I think another advantage, if you use flannel, you more or less um, need to line it to cover up the inside flannel. If you use a knit, it kind of makes its own lining that's perfectly acceptable right. uh, for, the, for the wrong side of the garment. And so. you could use cotton knits, viscose knits. Right. I don't think it really matters what the fiber is particularly. Uh -huh. But you get that l little bit of loftiness when you back it with either one of those. Right. Just, because the stitch draws down and then you create sort of a mat looking. And there. maybe a little more drape in the garment than the baby flannel. But. Right. That's true. So those would be beautiful. Kathy has to leave us, unfortunately. She has oh, another I do. <laughs> appointment. Thank you. So I'm going to carry on. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank All right. You. I'm going to talk about a few more fabrics, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, we have the same fabric as this. Uh, where to go here? As this fabric, the blue, but we also have it in the gray tones, and we do have this lovely. Uh, gray textured linen gauze and this is why can I not think of the name when it's cro cross-dyed I just thought of it where one thread is white and one thread is gray that's called cross-dyed so the cross-dyed linen to go on top of this but we also have some new denims in and they are really nice they're not heavy heavyweight denims like you might find in a pair of Levi jeans, but this is a wonderful gray uh, linen, excuse me, denim. We have this in a couple of other colors, but I was particularly struck by this gray color as a, here's a combination of, of putting uh, the linen on top of this or putting the gauze on top of this or this on top of this or this on top of this. I mean, all kinds of combinations, really. Then we've been talking about knits. So I think these are three colors of beautiful knits that could be layered. If you wanted to use the dark charcoal, ooh, now that I'm looking at this on top of these other colors, you could use any combination of knit and woven as well. So you have, this is a cotton knit. I might be inclined to pair it with my color of deep antique gold. Some parts of the garment could be cut out to reveal another color, or you can simply just bring the one color to the outside at an edge just to have a little bit of a snap of color, or it's just the lining and you know it's there. The other colorway that I think is beautiful with all of these really is this deep teal. I like all three of these together or individually. So don't forget about knit. All right, we also have some bags. I made this bag and Kathy made this bag. And these, both of these are made from the Provence bag pattern, which we have. This is the original size of the bag. And Kathy has done some stitching on some miscellaneous scraps, very burrow-like all kinds of little plaids and linens and stripes and so forth, but all running stitches in white. The bag is made from the kind of fabric that you make tea towels out of. It has that stripe to it. Of course, if you don't have that kind of fabric, you can use basic linen and you could apply this or you could stitch this if you like that. And then she's used the stripe, obviously, for the handle. This bag looks kind of simple, and it is. It's basically a rectangle, but there is this dimension to it. The front piece is actually made in two pieces, 
and this is a very interesting diagonal that forms this fullness to the front of the bag. This is, this is my go-to tote bag. I, I love this bag, sort of that daily tote bag. It could be a grocery bag, a project bag. I took the bag pattern and reduced it to 75%. So it's smaller, original size, 75%. And I used a couple of linens, one a railroad stripe and one the solid linen. And then I used raw edge patches on top of it, plus some painting. These stripes have actually been painted on. Learned that in Sarah Campbell's class. And then I sashiko stitched with a running stitch some raw edge patches on top of that. So if you want to just dip your toe into some hand stitching, Decide if it's for you or not. Think about a bag. Think about a tea cozy. Think about a placemat. Think about a pillow, something for your home. It doesn't have to be a major project like a jacket. But once you get your feet wet, then you could move on to a larger garment. All right, I think we've talked about everything. So do we have any questions today? Do. Um, this was from earlier in the um, Facebook Live. Um, do you use um, all the same weight of fabric? So I'm thinking with the jackets. Yes. Uh, the answer to that, do, you're mic'd now, so I don't need to repeat? Correct. All right. Wonderful. Uh, the answer is no. The, the fabrics do not have to be the same weight. For instance, if it's this combination, this is like a double cloth. So this has a certain uh, heaviness to it, even though it's still drapey. And this is a totally different feeling and weight. Uh, much lighter, not as drapey. I just think that you're looking for uh, visual uh, combinations more than weight combinations. Uh, we've been back in the back today looking at some combinations to introduce for tomorrow's class. And we were looking at things such as uh, a silk burnout on top of a knit, for example, or a handkerchief linen on top of a heavier linen or a knit as well. So the answer is no. I think you can do whatever you feel like doing. Okay. Um, they had a question about Kathy's scarf. Um, oh, Kathy's <laughs> scarf. That is our knotted scarf pattern. Uh, excuse me. No, that is not our knotted scarf. Uh, that's a scarf she made by knotting knit. She took one inch strips of knit, cut on the cross grain, and when you stretch a jersey knit that curls, then it becomes like a little tube. And so then she tied knots pretty frequently. I don't know what the distance was, maybe every four or five inches, and then has wrapped that around her neck and tied it. And so it's a series of knotted jersey knit strips of fabric. We do have, though, a pretty cool knotted scarf pattern that can be downloaded. The instructions are on our website. So you can check that out, too. Um, another question about um, her top, what, what you're wearing, and then also All right. what Kathy um, was Kathy wearing. Kathy was wearing the ET. I meant to point that out because she took an ET, used a fairly textured knit fabric, um, an ITY fabric, kind of a waffle weave fabric in the black and white. And that fabric was printed on the diagonal like that. It wasn't like she cut it on the bias. And then she appliqued by machine, I'm pretty sure, as I recall. Do you think it was machine, Erin? I, so. yeah. I think it was machine. Uh, she cut out pieces of kimono fabrics and cut out some of the motifs and machine stitched the appliques to the surface of that knit. I have on the Marceau tee in the two colors of knit, the red and white stripe, the black and white stripe. This is the one with the flouncy sleeve and the shifted fronts and backs. It's our newest pattern. Oh, I have on the getaway jeans, too. Forgot about that. I don't know, remember what she had on the bottom. I think it was Picasso pants. I think it was. She always has on Picasso pants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> OK, um, the vest that you pulled out, the, yeah. what was that pattern? This vest, thank you for asking, this is the peony vest. This is one of our download patterns. Normally it's buttoned, and this uh, 
lapel falls to one side or you can leave it open like this. It does have a split in the side. The instructions that you get as a download are for a more conventional sewing and it's also lined. There's a lining, uh, lining pieces included in the pattern. This obviously has just been more stripped out. The facings are gone, the lining is gone, and it's two layers of knit. Okay, and Samantha, what was Samantha wearing when she came in? Samantha, come on in, Samantha. Dress. Let's see this again. Uh, this is the Liberty jacket with the mix it neckline. Yes. And she's wearing it over a long version of the Cityscapes dress, yes. shorter sleeves, V neck, and she hasn't sewn the darts clear to the hem. She's left the darts open starting just below the hip. So turn around. And it's long. And it's Almost long. To, and when it she, is to my ankles. It's to her ankles. And she's left the slits on the side. And she, she has on fabulous red suede boots to go with them. <laughs> and I'm wearing her necklace today because or, ordinarily she'd have this necklace on too. But I love this necklace. And so I'm hoping you will will it to me. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there was a question about, um, and actually we should say hi to Nancy Shriver. She's on. Okay. Hello, Hello Nancy Shriver. <laughs> And a question about when you prepare your fabrics, do you wash everything, the flannel, the, you know, the silk, do you wash everything beforehand? Well, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, the answer is I don't usually I wash my silk dupionis, I don't wash my flannels, I don't wash my linings, and I'm certainly not going to wash the garment after I've done the sashiko stitching. Maybe Nancy can chime in if she's watching. I think she and I agree on that, but I could be wrong. Now, that's not to say you can't do that. When you wash Silk Dupioni, it does change the character of it a little bit. It breaks it down, it becomes a little uh, less of a sheen, a little less dressy, uh, perhaps cuts the sheen just a little bit, raises some of the fibers so it creates more texture. But uh, after, you've, after you have, well, let's go back to other fabrics. Would I wash the knits? Would I wash the linens? All of these fabrics are washable, and that is absolutely up to you. But after I've spent perhaps some serious hand stitching time, I'm not throwing this garment in the uh, washing machine. This is a dry clean garment. Nancy, are you there? Yes. Oh. You are correct. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Nancy. <laughs> you are correct. Thank <laughs> you, Nancy. She has confirmed what I just said. I was pretty sure you would say that. <laughs> I wish you were here, Nancy. Where are you? <laughs> okay, how do you decide on the amount of fabric to buy for the patch appliques? How do you decide how much? Oh, I don't need to repeat the questions anymore. I forget, <laughs> I forget that you have a long enough mic now. As long as everybody can hear me, yeah, and exactly. we're having issues. Well, uh, Kathy was saying yesterday that uh, for the top layers, she thinks about a yard and a half uh, of fabric would be good. My feeling is that whatever the base fabric takes in terms of yardage, why don't you just buy the same amount of yardage for the second layer because you're not really sure necessarily what you're going to be doing and you're only cutting away some bits and pieces. I'd be afraid to be skimpy about it. So if a jacket takes two yards of a base fabric, buy two yards of the upper fabric. But she did say that you can maybe buy a half a yard less or so of a top fabric if, uh, depending on the price and all that, I suppose. Do you use a hoop for the embroidery? Uh, using a hoop is really a personal thing. Um, Nancy Schreiber uses a hoop, as I recall. I have used a hoop, and I own a lot of hoops. I own a lot of sizes of hoops. A nine inch hoop for me is about as large as I want to handle. And I, in more recent times, I've, I've been not using a hoop. I sort of like the more uh, that my stitches aren't quite as perfect, but I'm pretty sure with uh, the flannel backed and the designs drawn on the flannel that Nancy uses a hoop. Nancy, you want to confirm that? And what size, maybe? Not yet, but she'll, she... <laughs> she'll, she'll come on in a minute. Maybe she'll chime I'm in. I'm sure she does. <laughs> Uh, the wooden hoops that I use, I do wrap one of the, let's see, it would be the um, inner hoop that I wrap so that it softens the edges of wood. There are some new interesting hoops out there. French General has a very interesting hoop that's metal that has a coil 
that fits in the recess of its hoop. I, I like that. It's, again, kind of a soft edge, and it's easy to manipulate. But it doesn't matter what kind of hoop you use. I think that is something personal. I think you try it without a hoop. You try it with a hoop and see what fits for you. She did chime in. She loves her hoop, um, and it's 12 inch. All right, Nancy Schreiber loves her hoop, and it's 12 inches. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> um, OK. What do you use for the underlining? And I think that's when you're talking about the flannel, but underlining of the silk sashiko jacket. All right, the silk sashiko jacket, the uh, silk sashiko jacket. I assume that's yeah. this one. Yes. All right, so this is Dupioni. Actually, this is uh, more of a Chantung. Dupioni has a little more character and texture to the fabric, but they're essentially the same. Dupionis are not as expensive as some Chantungs, and Chantungs are a little more refined, but at any rate, they're sort of the same kind of general category of fabric. So the top layer is the Chantung or Dupioni. The underlining or inner layer is cotton flannel, and then it's been lined in China silk, also Bemberg rayons. We have a lot of Bemberg rayons on our website now. We've added linings to our assortment of fabrics available. Um, if you're looking at Linda Wardlow's jacket, the outer jacket is wool, which as I recall, she washed. Not that she's going to wash this jacket, but I believe she washed the fabric. It's underlined with flannel. And then the lining is silk charmeuse. But in all of these cases, we've used the flannel as the underlining. So that means you cut out the top piece, you cut out the same thing again, you marry them, you hand stitch, hand baste around the edges, and treat the fabric and piece as one, even though it's two layers. That's what underlining uh, is. Don't confuse that with interlining. Interlining is a similar process, but the materials are different. Interlining is more for warmth and changing the character, mostly for warmth, really, changing the character of a piece of fabric. And you use something like thinsulate or wool or other kinds of things to make it warm. But underlining is the true word for the process we're doing here. Hey, and um, just to um, hopefully everybody can hear us. I know we're having issues with the mic, but we're trying to get that figured out. So we apologize. Um, the what type of thread did Kathy use on her blue linen coat? So I think the one behind on you. this one. This is white embroidery floss, basic embroidery floss that you can buy anywhere. And she used four strands. That's pretty much the type of thread that we're using here. Nancy Schreiber has used silk and cotton. I've used both of those. Kathy tends to use the cotton that you can buy in, this, in the little skeins. Uh, we uh, also have a little bit of Alabama Channon embroidery thread uh, that we sell. Doesn't matter whether it's DMC or Archer or, or what brand it is. There is a thread called Sashiko. And you can get that. If you Google Sashiko thread, you'll end up with a lot of resources for Sashiko thread. Sashiko, the difference between Sashiko thread and embroidery floss is embroidery floss is a stranded floss, generally six strands, and Sashiko thread is not stranded, and you don't separate it. So you can separate the floss into one, two, three, up to six individual strands. Sashiko, you use it as it is off the bolt or skein. Okay. There are also Sashiko patterns that you can buy. There are kits that you can buy. If you will Google Sashiko kits, you'll see some things that are either in indigo, blue fabric, or white fabric, and they have the pattern on them. Um, and, you, and it's already, already sort of set up for you for a pattern to follow. Okay. Um, do you carry the flannel? We do carry flannel. We don't have it on our website. So if that's something that you want, you would need to email us or call us, and we can certainly add it to your order. I have to tell you, there, flannel is, I'm kind of particular about my flannel. 
And actually, I like the flannel that they sell at either Hobby Lobby or Walmart. And I thought I would never say that in public, <laughs> but it's true. I think you're okay with a flannel that has a fairly good loft to it on both sides. You know, the flannel could even have bunnies on it. You're not going to really see it if you're going to line it. So it could have any sort of motif on it. But I tend to use a white flannel. Uh, we have some, or you can get it at either one of those sources as well. Okay, um, can you show where the sleeve meets the jacket? Um, I'm not sure which jacket. The sleeve meets the jacket. Um, well, all right, on the, on the London you have a sleeve insertion. These pieces were embellished separately, so there wasn't any thought that went into blending the design. I don't know if that's part of the question or not. Um, the other one, let's see, this one, the Chicago jacket does have an interesting sleeve insertion where the sleeve is this shape. Again, not too much thought of blending the sleeve and carrying the design from the sleeve into the body of the garment. The um, Tremont, I did this separately. You could, though, after you've constructed the garment, do some embellishment over a seam if you wanted to, to, make, to either disguise the seam or just to continue the design. Okay, so yeah, the question was related to wondering if you were trying to match it. Oh, no, not really. Not to say you couldn't do that, but none of us did that. Okay, I think that's it. You want to talk about the All right, sale? we have a lot of specials today. So pattern specials for printed patterns. We have the Now and Zen. This is the Now. We have the London, which is this one and the Chicago, those three patterns are on sale today for, for the next week for $18. And then digital patterns or download patterns, we have the London, the Peony Vest, and the Provence Bag patterns. They're on sale as well. All the fabrics that I've talked about here are 20% off. The Sewing Workshop book is 20% off and I will sign it for you. We also have some tutorials which I haven't talked about but we have three tutorials that relate to all of these. We have a very just fun little um, approach to another word that we haven't really talked about which is Zaka. Zaka style is also hand stitched, embellished items, it can be household goods, it can be garments as well running stitches and all that. We have a little uh, fun tutorial to look through called Zaka Style. That particular tutorial is $8. Then we have the uh, a one called Machine Sashiko Vest. This is a vest that was made by our friend Ann Nutting and it goes through the whole process of making a machine sashiko vest. That's done by machine rather than by hand. And there are machines, Baby Lock makes a machine that just does sashiko stitching. That's all it does. And that particular tutorial is $15. And then we have one called Sashiko Tremont Vest. And this is based on a vest that Nancy Schreiber made. That's a beautiful, beautiful pieced uh, vest with all over Sashiko sti stitching. It's gloriously beautiful. And that tutorial is $15 as well. So. OK. Um, and I was just going to say that if, if you are having trouble hearing, um, if you want to go to on the website and go to Linda's videos um, and go to embellished garments, that's where all of the um, products that are on sale, that's okay. where they're all listed. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.